This is the 22nd religious liberty campaign that I've been connected with. The years have gone by very quickly, but certainly studded with significant events. 9-11 was one which none of us will ever forget. In between invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, and most uh, recently, at least as far as a huge event, the collapse and slow rebuilding of the financial scene in 2008, not to mention the disturbances of our last presidential election. But Liberty Magazine is a constant throughout all of this. And as I've prepared the sermon for today, and you will excuse me if I read my own sermon because I want to be faithful to the text which we've sent out as part of the campaign. As I prepared this, I thought it could be no better titled than a testing time. There is a pun intended because with COVID, testing is, has been most significant before the uh, uh, inoculation was available. But as well as that, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we should know and have been reminded that we have been and still are in a testing time. It was the spring of 2020 and I wondered about the state of my vegetable garden. Several of my pumpkin vines look promising when I look closely. There were a number of swellings I recognised as the beginnings of a plentiful crop. And the tomato bushes were yellow with a profusion of flowers. The fig trees were already shaking off their dormancy with budding fruit along each branch. My garden would do well. In spite of, maybe because of the burning heat and with diligent watering, I might yet turn an exceptionally dry summer into an exceptional harvest. Kneeling over the vegetables, I thought I was alone until our neighbour spoke to me across our common fence close by my shoulder. Do you think this COVID-19 is one of the biblical plagues? She asked. I paused for a moment, thinking of the days yet to come before my garden produced its full potential. No, I said, it does not have the specific characteristics of the plagues described in Revelation. But it certainly is the type of thing Jesus Christ told us would characterise the time shortly before his return. I was thinking of Luke chapter 21 and Jesus replied to a similar question from those troubled more at the end of their nation than excited at the prospect of him returning to usher in an eternal kingdom. Jesus spoke of pestilence and other disasters as a prelude to the real action of faithful witness amid trial. The neighbour seemed calmed. But would she and how would she have reacted if I had said, yes, this is one of those plagues? Would she have changed in some way? Would a change then at such a late point have been particularly meaningful? And what does it take to impress someone, oneself even, that now is the time for decision? Now is a testing time. As a fourth generation Seventh-day Adventist and someone trained in our system and always close to centres of the church, I know how we have perceived our own movement and its place in end time events. Over the course of a lifetime, I have experienced the ebb and flow of our comprehension of, quote, the faith once delivered to the saints. Sometimes we think ourselves on the brink of final events. Other times we seem happier talking of conversion as almost a process of, of, of osmosis with the close of general probation far away and our individual death, perhaps the event to reference. In short, we cycle between the energetic Adventist pioneer response seen in 1888 to an incipient National Sunday Law and the lethargy and self-confidence of late 
that has followed a US civil administration speaking loudly and proudly of religious freedom as though the Roman Emperor Constantine were the best thing that ever happened to Christianity. A long-standing theme, but not so frequently repeated of late for Seventh-day Adventists is the Elijah message. For the Jews, Elijah was the greatest prophet, which is why so many tried to identify Jesus as the Elijah promised in Malachi 4, 5, which says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Jesus himself identified John the Baptist, the reformer, as someone who had come in the spirit and power of Elijah. Yes, we Adventists always thought of our mission that way. We are to prepare the way for the soon return of Christ. The Elijah message. If there is any parallel to be found between our times and Elijah's, it has to be the importance of knowing the apparent crisis from the real crisis. Then as now, it was a testing time. Elijah's day, as the Bible story begins, was a time of complacency, a time of vineyards and great holdings of wealth, a time of fraternity between Israel and the Sidonians in particular, a time of rather diverse spirituality, a time, I hazard to say, congenial to most of Israel. Certainly, few seemed troubled by the state of affairs. Apparently, Elijah was. The Apostle James identifies him as, quote, a man of like nature with ourselves. And I think James meant that Elijah was like one of the early Christians. He was a man who prayed fervently that it might not rain, says the Bible. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and the heavens gave rain and the earth brought forth its fruit. For this, Elijah was accused of being, quote, a troubler in Israel, as King Ahab later put it. Enlarging on the dynamic of this moment, Ellen White wrote in Testimonies, Volume 3, page 263, quote, Elijah's faithful soul was grieved. When he called to mind the great things that God had wrought for them, he was overwhelmed with grief and amazement. He went before the Lord and with his soul wrung with anguish, pleaded for him to save his people if it must be by judgments. And so the drought. But the real crisis was a famine of a different kind. As Amos wrote a few decades later, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Our COVID-19 social reorganization has changed many things. Life is very likely never to go back to the way it was. Some of the adaptations are rational responses to societal threat. Others have some perhaps unintended consequences. Around the middle of last year, Russell Moore, president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission for the Southern Baptist Convention, gave a long interview on PBS. I was struck by two related points he made. First, he acknowledged a rapid and continuing drop off in church attendance in recent years. Second, he agreed that with COVID-19, a critical mass of Christian believers just seemed to melt away in the crisis. He had no explanation. When Elijah showed himself to Ahab, after three years of drought, faith in Israel was at a low ebb. The prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth were numerous and well accepted at court. Worship of the one true God was not acceptable 
unless combined with the worship of elemental spirits and harvest fertility rites. There had, of course, been persecution. Most had compromised, many had been killed. But as Obadiah, head of the king's household, told Elijah at their first meeting, he had sheltered 100 prophets in caves to save their lives. All was not lost, even though most had fallen away. But on Mount Carmel, it is hard to see signs of faithfulness. Elijah throws out a challenge to the people. How long, he says, will you go limping with two different opinions? Not a word of answer is given. In reading Ellen White's comments on this, I am taken by her description of a, as she puts it, a dark cloud of unbelief that had settled over the people. What a figure to use. A little later after God's fiery sign and Elijah's prayers, a, a little dark cloud foreshadows a great rain. And much later, nearer our time, the Elijah call is to precede another little dark cloud, which rapidly lightens into earth filling glory. My take on the spiritual darkness then as now is that it makes it near impossible to even comprehend the possibility of coming glory. And regarding their silence, again, Ellen White speaks to our time when she writes that to do nothing in a time of crisis, God regards as rebellion. Heavy thought. Many times I've listened to the stirring music of Felix Mendelssohn's oratorio, The Elijah. What particularly stands out to me musically and textually is the scene on Mount Carmel where Elijah faces off a hostile crowd of false prophets, the frown of the ruling elite and the sullen silence of the people. The false prophets have paraded and convorted, laughed and babbled in vain. The rulers seem still under their influence. However, when Elijah steps forward to pray for fire, later for rain. O Lord God of Abraham, he prayed, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that thou, O Lord, art God and that thou hast turned their hearts back. That's from 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 36 and 37. The result was fire. Then more prayer and rain. Power was given to Elijah to run in the rain in front of Ahab's chariot all the way from the brook, brook Kidron to the palace at Jezreel. That's a distance, when I looked it up, of at least 17 miles and as many as 30 miles. A marathon. Then a massive threat revealed itself to Elijah. He was told that Queen Jezebel was determined to have his life for that of her prophets. And so the runner sets off again. As 1 Kings 19 verse 4 puts it, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. There were enough real threats to justify Elijah's fear. There were clear physical and emotional reasons why he might have reacted this way. He had forgotten God's leading in the past. He thought himself alone. The great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, put it in perspective this way. Quote, when we read the scriptures in our youth, we are often astonished at the peculiar conditions in which we find even good men. It is difficult for us to understand why such a man as Elijah could be so dreadfully downcast. As we get older and become more experienced, 
as trials multiply around us and our inner life enters upon a sterner conflict, as the babe grows to manhood and therefore is entrusted with heavier tasks, we can better understand why God allowed his ancient servants to be put into such peculiar positions for we find ourselves in similar places and we are relieved by discovering that we are walking along a path which others have traversed before us. I wonder if these days of COVID have not brought us to a similar point. To us, God might also ask, what are you doing here? Our days of COVID-19 might well be the beginning of crowding alarms and threats that will merge into what we still think of as the end times or the time of trouble. Are we content to shelter in place, masks securely on, social distance carefully kept, dabbling in social media as the world swirls and moves about us? This new normal, to use the uh, emerging uh, term, this new normal inaugurated by a global pandemic has some very pertinent aspects to it for Adventists. We were long ago warned that funds we might have given to the work will in a day of financial crisis prove worthless. A kind US government has opened its storehouses to give COVID relief to all, even offered monies to churches. But these are virtual funds at best in an economy way beyond the debasing of currency that brought down the coin clipping Roman Empire. Massive unemployment and dislocation always lead to social unrest and war a difficult context for evangelization. There is, of course, a healthcare imperative behind stern measures, but whole populations under lockdown or under severe social distancing is the stuff of depersonalization and creates the isolation and sense of powerlessness necessary for less than democratic models while the infection mechanism for COVID is still not clearly known. Even as I speak, an unfortunate attitude has emerged as a result of church assembly infections. It is the idea that religion is dangerous to public health. And by meeting together, even in a parking lot, people of faith are actually ready to harm their neighbours. Strangely, that guilt has not so easily transferred to block parties, political rallies, grocery shopping, or mass public demonstrations. Meanwhile, we have witnessed an unprecedented political expression of a religious agenda in the United States. We Adventists should have been immune to its strange fire appeal, but many of us are as gladdened by it as the people of Elijah's time by the state-sponsored displays of Baal. This is clearly a harbinger of religious legislation and a compulsion to Sunday worship. Years ago, a seasoned religious liberty leader came to me and with a straight face and forgetfulness of the great controversy told me that we were now in a new paradigm The scenario outlined in Great Controversy, he said, was how God intended it to be. But with the delay, he said, there is a change dynamic. We are now to be allied with Rome in the battle against secularism. But of course he was mistaken. And in the space of a few years, the Great Controversy scenario is manifestly revealing itself before our eyes. Rome is resurgent and is the dominant world religious power. The current Pope has visited this once Protestant stronghold and lectured our legislators to general acclaim. The once firmly Protestant leadership here 
are enamored with Rome and are more concerned with fighting secularism and gaining political power in order to bring this nation back to its presumed Christian nation structure. Among many other issues, Rome has settled on saving the planet from environmental destruction. We Adventists might find that something we can agree upon, of course. After all, that first angel of Revelation chapter 14 gives a call to honour the God of creation. The document spelling out the papal environmental agenda is above all premised on the model of the seventh day Sabbath as a way back, the way back to God's original plan for his creation. Again, we Seventh-day Adventists might be warmed by that Sabbath imperative, given in a document which says that this is a matter of planetary survival. But the great controversy had it right. The papal document, after so plainly asserting a Seventh-day Sabbath dynamic, then applies it to, quote, the Eucharistic Sunday. Previous papal documents lie behind the ecological initiative and give it a clear doctrinal and political perspective. The 1998 document, Dies Domini, says plainly that while the early Christians had no direct word on changing the day from the Saturday Sabbath to Sunday, in quotes, they felt that they had the authority to do so. And the 2008 document, Caritas in Veritate, in dealing with the plethora of world problems, most particularly that global financial crisis that I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, lays it out very clearly in calling for a world authority, quote, with the power to act and to enforce. One secular magazine I read in giving a good review of that document, worried that the problem was that in accepting it, the Pope came with it. And of course, they might as well have read Revelation and the great controversy for the backstory on that. Meanwhile, a critical mass of politically active American Protestants are clamoring for laws that will take us back to an imagined American religious dream time. You and I have been told that taking a leaf from the methods of the medieval church, this group will eventually raise a clamor for legislators to pass a national Sunday bill in the United States to avert God's displeasure. Meanwhile, COVID-19 emergencies diminish religion to a non-essential service, even as fires raged unchecked in the West, storms in the East, and national financial ruin, a gathering cloud behind millions of unemployed. Supply the latest in a growing list of natural calamities as you wish. Going by the book indeed. You are no doubt used to religious liberty updates that cite this court case and uh, that piece of legislation And these can be markers of religious freedom progress or regression. At present, there is much talk of religious liberty, usually religious entitlement for one particular religious viewpoint, but little real positive action. At best, there is a legislative and judicial holding pattern, even as the civil liberties and constitutional rights for citizens and rulers alike are in serious flux. Years ago at a, uh, an afternoon religious liberty question and answer, Q&A we call them, an older gentleman, I don't know his age and maybe I'm heading in this direction, but an older gentleman stood up and put up his hand and he said, tell us when we should be afraid. It's a question the watching crowd on Mount Carmel might have asked of Elijah before the fire came down from heaven. But not a good question for an Adventist to ask. This is not a time for fear, but for excitement and increased action for the Lord. 
I used to give uh, really regular religious liberty updates for my uh, uh, late father. Perhaps I was hoping to get some startled reaction from him. Uh, his answer was always the same. Isn't it exciting, son, he would say. The Lord is about to come. So in this testing time, this COVID quiet before the real contagion, we must reaffirm our blessed hope. Religious liberty is not a dry theory, but the dynamic of pushing back against the darkness to spread more gospel light while we can. A bare century before the American Revolutionary War, England experienced a full-blown civil war. Before that war was over, it became a religious struggle and a Puritan minority seized power in a brief Republican experiment. The man still held second only to Shakespeare in the English language. John Milton was in the midst of that struggle. Today, his uh, work, Area Pagitiga, remains the model of an argument for freedom of speech. And uh, his other, another one of his works, the uh, tenure of kings and magistrates, is enshrined without attribution in the Declaration of Independence. It was the argument for throwing off the despotic uh, rule of a faraway king who had exceeded his bounds. He was a signatory to the death decree for King Charles I and Milton barely escaped execution when the monarchy was returned to power. In his old age, totally blind, he dictated a massive and magisterial work called Paradise Lost. Its purpose, he stated in the preface, was, quote, to justify the ways of God to man. In book number 10 of that long work, he has the angel in Eden explain certain things to the guilty pair and outlining to them God's plan to defeat evil and reinstate mankind to his initial glory. It is the great controversy theme, which Adventists know very well by way of the great controversy. But this was a precursor to the Adventist vision of that conflict that we now know and should proclaim so clearly. Note the following excerpt that I'll conclude. It's not a short excerpt, but this excerpt I want to share with you brings us down to our day and explains the dynamic of what we're presently involved with. This is what Milton wrote. And remember, this is the angel explaining things to Adam and Eve, and it begins with Adam asking a question. But say, asks Adam, if our deliverer up to heaven must reascend, what will betide the few, his faithful, left among the unfaithful herd, the enemies of truth? Who then shall guide his people? Who defend? Will they not deal worse with his followers than with him they dealt? Be sure they will, said the angel, but from heaven he to his own a comforter will send the promise of the Father, who shall dwell his spirit within them and the law of faith working through love upon their hearts shall write to guide them in all truth and also arm with spiritual armour, able to resist Satan's assaults and quench his fiery darts. What man can do against them, not afraid, though to the death, against such cruelties with inward consolations recompensed and oft supported so as shall amaze their proudest persecutors. For the Spirit powered first on his apostles, whom he sends to evangelize the nations, then on all baptized, shall them with wondrous gifts endue, as did their Lord before them. Thus they win great numbers of each nation to receive with joy the tidings brought from heaven. At length, their ministry performed and race well run, their doctrine and their story 
written left, they die. But in their room, as they forewarn, wolves shall succeed for teachers, grievous wolves, who all the sacred mysteries of heaven to their own vile advantage shall turn of lucre and ambition and the truth with superstitions and traditions taint, left only in those written records pure, though not but by the spirit understood. Then shall they seek to avail themselves of names, places and titles, and with these to join secular power, though feigning still to act by spiritual, to themselves appropriating the spirit of God, promised alike and given to all believers. And from that pretense, spiritual laws by carnal power shall force on every conscience, laws which none shall find left in them and ruled or what the spirit within shall on the heart engrave. What will they then but force the spirit of grace itself and bind his consort liberty? What but unbuild his living temples built by faith to stand, their own faith, not another's. For on earth who against faith and conscience can be heard infallible? Yet many will presume whence heavy persecution shall arise on all who in the worship persevere of spirit and truth. The rest, far greater part, will deem an outward rites and specious forms religion satisfied. Truth shall retire, bestruck with slanderous darts and works of faith rarely be found. So shall the world go on to good malignant, to bad men benign, under her own weight groaning till the day appear of respiration to the just and vengeance to the wicked at return of him so lately promised to thy aid. The woman's seed, obscurely then foretold, now amply anon, thy saviour and thy Lord, last in the clouds from heaven to be revealed in glory of the Father to dissolve Satan with his perverted world, then raised from the flagrant mass, purged and refined, new heavens, new earth, ages of endless date, founded in righteousness and peace and love to bring forth fruits of joy and eternal bliss. Harvest time, time up, test over. Thank you so much for being part of our Religious Liberty service today. This is really an important service because we as Christians have to always remember that religious freedom is something we have to continue to fight for. Many people don't realize that around the world, 80% of the world is not allowed to serve God in the way that they see fit. And so it's on moments like this where we get a chance to remind others that your freedom should not be taken for granted. So on this Sabbath that we've set aside for Religious Liberty Sabbath, this is an opportunity for you to provide an offering that will be able to support us here in the North American Division, to go out and to connect with individuals that will let them know that we serve a God who is more powerful than anything, but we also want to make sure that we continue to ensure our religious freedom for all. Thank you again for being a part of our program, and we thank you for the partnership that you have given us and supported us in the Public Affairs and Religious Liberty Office over the many years. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day, and we thank you for an opportunity that we as Christians can sit here and worship our God the way we see fit. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us in the past and what you will do for us in the future, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you would protect our freedom, Lord, and help us to go out and fight for those who are in need. And we thank you, God, that it's not about who's in charge of our country or who's in charge of the world, but you've reminded us that he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Be with us till you come again. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray, amen.